I'm Tyler Don Rosenquist, and welcome to Character in Context, where I usually teach the historical and ancient sociological context of scripture, with an eye to developing the character of the Messiah, but not right now. Right now, I'm doing a series about how to not waste your time with bad study practices, bad resources, and just the general confusion that I faced when I started studying the Bible and was trying to figure out what to do and whose books I should read. Bottom line, I read a lot of nonsense and spent a ton of money on it. I'm going to give you some of the basics on how to avoid a lot of the pitfalls, save money, and maximize your time and effort, and get the most out of what you're doing. And my master book list can be found linked to the transcript on um, theancientbridge.com. Well, this episode is going to be a ton of fun, at least for me. I'm a nerd. And it might be very challenging for you or not. So just bear with me and hear me out. People love to say that they take the Bible literally at face value and that they believe absolutely everything it says. Now, if we take the first part of that, taking the Bible literally would actually mean using the real or original meaning, which is what we've been talking about. Poetry has to be read differently than narrative, which has to be read differently than a proverb or an apocalypse. Everyone would agree with that. Beyond that, it isn't always easy, even when knowing that we are reading poetry or narrative, you know, to understand the real or original meaning. God's intention in communicating a message through human beings. Now, we'll get back to that in a bit, because when people say literally, that's generally not what they mean. What they mean is that they're taking the Bible word for word, claiming that they are believing what the plain text says. The problem is that no one really does that, nor should we, because the Bible is literature, written in foreign languages with some words that don't even exist anymore. Hence, we can only guess at the meaning from the context in which we find them. Um, it was written to people with an entirely different worldview, who used different idioms and had different metaphors about the world and the human body and how things worked and makes, you know, it makes glorious use of metaphors and allegories and parables and puns and all sorts of colorful language that cannot ever be understood word for word any more than our own modern literature can. So people who claim to take the Bible literally get themselves into trouble when the Bible collides with what is obviously true. And when challenged, um, they'll then claim that such and such is a metaphor or an idiom, and sometimes it is, but sometimes it isn't. But when they make that admission, they are inadvertently owning the plain fact that no one can believe what the Bible programmatically says word for word. Doesn't work that way and it never has, and it can't. And God didn't give it to us that way. Is that to say that nothing in the Bible can be understood word for word? Of course not. But it all depends on what we are reading and how that type of literature functions. If we take Revelation or certain parts of Daniel as being word for word something that did or will happen with fantastic beasts and mountains being thrown in the ocean, we'll be butchering the text. You know, we know that Revelation and Daniel are both symbolic, and they paint these elaborate pictures. I'm going to teach you three words this week that I will use a lot so that you can know them. They're actually pretty useful and extremely important to understand. And not just when reading the Bible. They're important on social media as well. The first word is locution. And it means the way something's communicated. I am locuting this first by typing it out. Then I will locute it again by speaking it and recording it. If you read the transcript, you will be receiving this as a written text. And if you listen, you will receive it as what's called an oral text. Locution is how you are given a message out loud, in writing, or in sign language. Locution is how I decided to give you the message. If you're a Star Trek fan, when Jean-Luc Picard was captured by the Borg and turned into a drone, his name was Locutus of Borg. And the reason for that name is that the Borg was speaking through him. He was their chosen method 
of communication. Locutus was their locution. Word that's similar is illocution. And this one is much easier to understand. Illocution is the intention of the author or speaker. If I'm not clear in what I write or say in my locution, then you will not understand my intention, my illocution. Hello, epistles of Paul. As Peter said, you know, some of the things that Paul wrote, his locution were hard to understand, and so people would twist what he said as if his intentions, his illocutions, was something else entirely. And I actually have a silly way of remembering this. If I am communicating something to you with ill will, then you are going to get a nasty letter and you will know that my illocution was hostile. It was my intention to let you know that I'm not happy with you. Okay, so ill, illocution, ill will, illocution. Perlocution is the effect that my words have on you. I made up the mantra, bad perlocution can result in persecution. <laughs> Locutus, ill will, and persecution are my memory aids. Let's do this. Paul wasn't always clear with his locution, and so some people understand his illocution, which led to some pretty disastrous perlocution. This is why there is so much confusion on Paul's stance of women leading. On one hand, you have all the occasions where he's clearly allowing and supporting it, and then we have the two verses where it seems as though he doesn't. What was his illocution? His intention. Did he allow and encourage women to teach or only in certain cities where the culture would support it? His locution, what he said, isn't entirely clear and so the perlocution has historically been a general ban on women teaching in the church. But as we become more educated in the context of Paul's letters and the first century in general, many are questioning if we were wrong about Paul's illocution, what he was trying to say, and if our perlocution, its effect on us and our response has been wrong. The whole point of me even saying this is to go back to the beginning of today's lesson. If we are going to take the Bible literally, it requires knowing the real or original meaning and acting on it appropriately. And sometimes we just don't know, and we have to do our best while relying on the Spirit to correct us. And that should make us incredibly humble with the Bible. It should, but, you know, usually we just set up camps about things that we can't know for sure, and we fight as though the Bible is easy to understand. And some people claim it is easy to understand, but then teach us their take on it anyway. When you think about it, it's kind of strange. What about taking the Bible at face value? Well, that creates even more problems because the Bible isn't a modern book and it doesn't play by our rules. The authors were interested in telling the truth about God, not about everything being painfully accurate. There are parts of the Bible that disagree with one another on, and some people try to fudge what the Bible says to make everything agree because we tend to think that accuracy is the same as truth when it absolutely isn't. The Gospels like to tell the same story four different ways, with facts somewhat different, in order to make true points. This is not only how ancient Judaism communicated, but all of the ancient world. I can tell you the truth by telling you a parable, but my parable will not be an accurate story. You can't take it at face value as though Lazarus was a real person who is now resting in the bosom of Abraham while the rich dude who ignored him can see him across a chasm and is still whining for water. But some people have created doctrines of heaven and hell based on it, assuming that we can take a parable at face value. But they don't even try to do that with the parable of the sower or the parable of the prodigal son because they are obviously just stories and not many documentaries. If we take the Bible literally, according to its real or original meaning, we can't treat parables differently than the original audience would have. What about descriptions of the earth, or our bodies, or about Yahweh's appearance or gender? 
If we're taking the Bible at face value, and many are doing that when it comes to the shape of the earth, we have to say that the earth is flat, and not only flat, but surrounded by mountains that hold up a solid dome, with water above the dome and water beneath the earth, and that the earth is held up by literal pillars. I have no idea what the, the pillars are supposed to be resting on, actually. Now, some people will say these are just metaphors, you know, saying that the earth is one thing when it's actually another. But we know from archaeology that everyone in the ancient world believed this to be true. In the ancient Near East, anyway. I don't know about, like, other places. It isn't a pagan belief. It's a pre-scientific, mythological belief. And although people associate the word mythology with stories of gods and goddesses and, and something being fiction and false, a myth is really just a story explaining something that cannot be explained yet. That's why all the nations had stories about why it doesn't rain in the summer. The Babylonians, for example, thought that Tammuz was locked away in the underworld for half a year, not dead but imprisoned by his wife, or how the sun gets across the sky and where it goes at night. They were exceedingly intelligent and clever in what they came up with. It isn't too hard to understand why they looked for reasonable answers in both their own architecture and what they could understand up close and how they made assumptions about things that were far away and mysterious. It wasn't pagan, it just wasn't scientific. They're two things in entirely. They were too busy trying to survive. Science is performed by people with time on their hands and plenty of food and adequate shelter. But there are people who are using the Bible to divide the body based not on what is and is not sinful, not Christ and him crucified, but based upon what a person does or does not believe about the shape of the earth. The Bible was written to reveal God and his rescue plans for humanity, our journey back to Eden to dwell with him forever as he intended at the beginning. Teaching science would have been a waste of paper, but he's so wise and compassionate that he used what they thought they knew in order to teach them truths about himself. God still meets us where we are, and I can assure you that if he decided to teach science to us, that we wouldn't understand it. As a scientist, let me assure you that we don't know all that much. Now, other passages assure us that we think and feel from the neck down. And that's exactly what the entire world believed until about 500 BCE, when the Greeks figured out that the Egyptians had made a big mistake by removing the useless brains from their mummies, thinking that they could do all their thinking and feeling in the afterlife with hearts, bowels, and kidneys. This is actually why, in those old movies, mummies want people's brains. Now, when we come to uh, the Gospel accounts, Yeshua, or you may call him Jesus, changes up the Shema, to reflect this change of understanding, and he included the command to love Yahweh with all of our minds, in addition to the rest of us. Why? Because by that point, his audience knew that thinking was done with the brain and not with the heart. Were these metaphors? No, this was just primitive science based entirely upon some bad and some clever assumptions. These reflected actual beliefs until they were later proven wrong. And it's okay that God wasn't acting like a PhD in kindergarten, making sure the kids are burdened with the concept of negative numbers. God isn't boorish. He meets us where we are. If you've ever been around someone who would rather show off what they know than teach people, you totally understand what I'm talking about. But figures of speech are actually what I wanted to discuss and truly the best way to talk about how Scripture portrays Yahweh. Now, apart from assertions about his character, the authors were forced to deal in humanization and metaphors in order to give us ideas about how to relate to Yahweh and how he wants to relate to us. I mean, let's be honest here. He is entirely ineffable and his being is inexpressible. And those are just fancy words, meaning that we are incapable of imagining or describing how he really is. We're crippled by limited intellect, which is a fancy way of saying we're just too stupid. And we're also crippled by our languages, which can only describe things that we already understand. And so we are completely incapable of capturing Yahweh or pinning down his absolute nature. We just are. 
And so we must cling, cleave, remember his works, trust, and love him. We have no other choice, unless it's to decide to run the opposite direction from anything we just can't fit neatly into a box. Scripture says he is seen and unseen, invisible, and yet the Bible's full of anthropomorphic descriptions of him. Anthropomorphic is simply a word that means giving humanish descriptions to something that's not human. Anthropos is the Greek word for human, and morphe is the Greek word meaning in the former shape of. So when we anthropomorphize anything, try saying that 15 times fast, we describe it as having human characteristics, even though it's not human. First off, can we all agree that Yahweh is not a human being? That he isn't just a more evolved form of us or that we are a less evolved form of him? Can we agree that he isn't built with DNA like we are? Like, you know, where would the DNA even come from? Someone had to create it. And he doesn't have what we would call a genetic makeup. After all, Yahweh can't be all in all if he is limited by our biological realities. And he'd need DNA to have gender. You know, but he knew that he needed a way to be real to us. We are largely incapable of understanding anything or anyone that doesn't have a physical form. I'm a chemist, and it's hard enough for me to wrap my mind around waves and waving particles and energy and all that. I simply accept it. We know they are there because of what they do, and we can also perceive God by what he does. But they couldn't conceive of anything making things happen without a physical reality. And this is why they fashioned idols in the ancient world, because the substance of the gods needed to be fed or they would starve to death. Yahweh, being non-physical, has no physical needs. And even if he was, he could make his own food. It'd be better than anything we could give him. This is why Yahweh spent so much time stressing this to them, outlawing idols, and it was very difficult for them to understand for a long time. Heck, we can hardly deal with it ourselves, and, you know, so there are a lot of depictions of Yahweh as an old white dude. And he understands this about us, so he chose to place the fullness of his being in the Son, Yeshua, you may call him Jesus, so that he could tangibly show us what he is like. But before that, he had to break them of thinking of him like the other gods who were male and female and sometimes half human and half animal. To a patriarchal society, Yahweh presented himself functionally as a father, and yet elsewhere we see, like in Numbers uh, 2319, this is from the Christian Standard Bible, God is not a man that he might lie, or a son of man that he might change his mind. Yahweh is big on communicating how he relates to us, but we take it too far when we make him like us. He's nothing like us, thank God. If he was, then we wouldn't be a creation. He wouldn't have to create man because man would already be pre-existent in himself. God also identifies functionally as a mother, and yet he's not female either. God smelled the sacrifices and was soothed, and yet he had no nose. He sees things without eyes and hears things without ears, reaches out his hand when he has no hands, and turns his face against evil despite not having a face. Yet he speaks through these images that liken him to a human being, taking on roles that we can relate to even though they can also give us wrong ideas about him when taken out of context. Remember, Yahweh spent a long time breaking us of the idea that he was a physical being before he was able to come to us in human form. If he had come as a human right away, we'd still be worshipping idols with no way to break us of it. Remember, that's anthropomorphism, causing Yahweh to take on the form of a human. We tend to think of things in terms of form, but in the ancient world, they were all about functionality. So Yahweh takes on the function of father and mother and husband and shepherd so that we can think of those roles. In a single verse, you know, Deuteronomy 32, 19, He's described as a rock who is a father and also as the one who birthed them. Many of these are metaphors uh, as when Yahweh's called a rock, a shepherd, a shield, a fortress. And for that matter, we're called sheep, goats, 
unruly cattle, clay, etc., etc. This is very different from a comparison or a simile when something or someone is said to be like or as something else, so like or as. The Bible accomplishes this description of functionality through the use of metaphors, which is comparing two things without using the words like or as. It's a more jarring form of comparison. We know that Yahweh isn't actually a rock, but functionally, we trust him because he cannot be moved. We know that we aren't actually the genetic offspring of Yahweh, and we know that he didn't give birth to us, even though the plain reading of the text says otherwise. We know that we aren't actually sheep, goats, or unruly calves, and he doesn't spend his days and nights leading us around to find grass. He isn't made of iron or brass so that we can hold him in front of us to block the arrows of our enemies, which aren't actually arrows either, hopefully. His name isn't constructed of rock and mortar so that we can physically take refuge in it like an actual tower. However, these metaphors are gifts that he has given us so that we can know what to expect from him. And so that we can also begin to understand his character. Of course, not every description of him is metaphorical. He's literally our creator, provider, and savior. Yeshua was big on using similes, which are a bit different. He'd say something like, the kingdom of heaven is like a sower, a mustard seed, a woman leavening her batches, treasure, a merchant in search of fine pearls, a large net thrown into the sea, a landowner who hired workers for his vineyard, ten virgins, a king who gives a banquet for his son. You know, you get the picture. And then Yeshua would tell a parable and give them a puzzle to figure out his meaning. Parables were designed to produce both deep thought and confusion to get people really thinking about the kingdom of heaven and how it might be entirely different than they had previously believed. And he had similes to describe us as well. To what can I compare this generation? Are we like children sitting in the marketplace demanding that everyone dance to our tune? Or are we like fools who build a house upon the sand or wise men who build upon a rock? Sheep among wolves, wise as serpents, gentle as doves, sheep, sheep without a shepherd, or whitewashed tombs? Similes are incomplete comparisons. If someone says you're a jerk, they're not meaning it as a metaphor or a simile. They aren't comparing you to a jerk. They're telling you that that's what you are. And so we have to navigate statements that are made in Scripture with wisdom. Some are meant to be taken at face value, and others are comparisons. There's no one single rule to follow. We have to be intelligent readers, and it isn't easy sometimes. A lot of times. What happens when we don't recognize figures of speech? Oh, we can come to some really misguided opinions. How about 2 Peter 3.8? Dear friends, don't overlook this one fact. With the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. We have people interpreting this not as a simile despite the twofold usage of like, but as an equivalency. But Peter, Paul, and the others expected Yeshua to come back fairly quickly, and it is unlikely that Peter here is prophesying a literal timeline. He's making a reference to another simile in Psalm 90. In context, Peter is dealing with those who are scoffing because Yeshua hasn't already come back. And his simile simply reflects that Yahweh's timetable doesn't look like ours. It isn't necessarily a formula, but an incomplete comparison. Time works differently from Yahweh's perspective. What seems urgent to us is something he takes his time to work on. How about when Yeshua said, For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. In context, this was entirely about marriage in the world to come, and in that respect, we will be like the angels, but many people, you know, look at that and again, make it an equivalency that we will be angels, but we and the angels both are simply different sorts of created beings. It's really important to understand what we're reading. And I'll see you next week. We're going to talk about polemic, unless I do like a special Hanukkah thing. Well, we'll see. I haven't decided yet.